Hi, welcome. I'm Anura the Kotha from the Kotha Constellation. And I wanted to share a few words I had about the topic of shame. I haven't been doing videos for the public in quite some time. And part of that reason is around this topic of shame. It is something I've been holding in my heart and in my body for many years. And it has really come to the point where I need to talk about it. And I wanted to I'm hoping that my experience and my words here help you and release something in you too, perhaps. I wanted to share this for a, a number of reasons that A, it's close to my heart and um, once again, trying to be of service to people, but I also wanted to break my silence and really name some of the things happening and share how I'm dealing with it. Because these kinds of topics, we often don't have a lot of airtime, at least that I have noticed in my life and from my perspective. And I'm going to be looking down at my notes occasionally so I don't stray too far off what I wanted to say. So as I said, I haven't been doing videos recently, and I want, I, so I might be a little rusty, forgive me, and I also wanted to share something really deeply personal, but I am withholding key significant pieces, and that is not because, um, well, that's because I want to protect my privacy a little, and I want to do that in a way that doesn't detract from the narrative and from the the feelings and the things that I have done to get out of this funk for myself. So I don't want the details to be derailing in any way. So hence, they are very general. You can probably fill in the blanks in your own way from your own experiences, because some of the stories that I'm going to share here, some of the pieces maybe have happened to you in some way or another. I also want to give a note around a content or trigger warning that some of the things I might say, even though I'm not going to be talking about anything graphic or so on, that they will be difficult topics. So take care of yourself in any way that you need to. That might include turning off the video or, you know, reading the <laughs> the notes instead of watching the actual video or perhaps making sure you have support from a therapist or other people who can help you process anything that this brings up. So look after yourself in that way. Part of why I'm sharing is because as we continue to share these things in different ways, then we normalize these stories and we stop this culture of victim blaming that often happens. So some of the things I wanted to share is a few years ago, a number of years ago, and this was more than one situation, I was assaulted by somebody, um, specifically men. And, and that was a very difficult situation. And I noticed that afterward in the community, in how I see them interacting, they're able to hold their head up high. They deserve respect from the community and command that respect. So they're, they aren't diminished in the eyes of anyone. And yet I didn't feel the same way. I didn't feel like I could go around and behave in the same way anymore. I felt slighted in a way. I felt diminished and ashamed. And I hang, I hung on to that shame. Similarly, I was with, in a romantic relationship, I was engaged to marry someone many years ago now. And people, and it was an abusive situation. And the, the difficulty was so many people at that time, as I was trying to speak up, as I was trying to part ways and hold on to any semblance of dignity as any semblance of who I was and what that meant in my life to part ways with this person. A lot of people were saying, oh, we don't know the whole story. We don't want to take sides. We want to stay friends with both of you. And it felt like this very difficult place that people didn't believe me. 
that they didn't think that that was true, any of the things I had said. And so I believed them. I thought, oh, maybe I maybe I'm not remembering right. And part of my own trauma history around this and my own patterns from early on in my life has been to not take some of the things seriously, not believe myself. So that self-gaslighting mechanism would always kick in and say, are you sure? Because other people aren't believing you. Did that really happen in that same way? You know, so it would come to a place of, I don't know. So I'd feel very strong about it. Hey, that happened. I remember this. And then as I would tell it, or as I would think about it, or as I would try to process, I would fall back into a pit of shame and fall into a place where I don't know what's happening, uh, that I am losing who I am. I'm losing my voice. I'm doubting what happened to me. I'm de- and, and as I was reminded the other day, I might not remember everything in the, in the way that it happened, but my body certainly couldn't forget, didn't forget. And this, this cultural piece, so this happens globally. We still have a system of patriarchy, uh, cishet patriarchy and white supremacy culture and so on that impounds or makes these situations even more difficult in the world, right? There are power imbalances. And when it comes to interpersonal violence, there is also a systemic or institutionalized level that protects often the person creating the violence, creating the harm, they're often protected. And the person who has undergone the abuse or undergone the trauma, they are impacted in a way that A, part of the brain actually learns to silence ourselves, that the Broca center in the brain make it difficult for us to speak up for ourselves especially in some trauma survivors, but also that there's also the added element of my upbringing being of um, an Asian diasporic person, South, South, my parents are from South India, a lot of relatives still live in India or abroad. And so that cultural aspect also impacted me. And I didn't realize for a long time, that's what what I was carrying. I could name it only indirectly, that I would see something is there, something is making things happen internally, perhaps that is connected with my trauma and my neurodivergence. And, um, and of course, it's also connected to my chronic illness in some ways. But I couldn't name it directly, that this is a weight that I'm carrying. And a few weeks ago, I watched a video, and if I can find the link of it, I will share it in the somewhere where I can share some words, um, some text. If I can find the link, I will share it. But it was a short video, about 10 to 12 minute video about a South Asian diasporic person, either from India or Pakistan, I don't remember. And they, they are British Asian. So they're living here in in the UK, and they decide, you know, that there it was decided for them at a young age that they were going to marry somebody. And so around the age of 14, this person is share, you know, they're sharing this story now as an adult, as a survivor, that they were basically going to be forced to marry this person. And they were locked in their room, their bedroom, until they agreed. So they agreed, they pretended to agree. And then when they were out, they ran away and escaped. And and their family said, either you come back and marry this person or you'll be disowned. And the story doesn't, you know, she tells her story, but more importantly, she talks about her sister who hadn't run away, who had accepted that and was in a not so great marriage as this in this arrangement. And then later um, had divorced this person and married someone different. And it was also abusive and not a great situation. And the sister decided that the only way out of this was to burn themselves, to kill themselves. And so at the funeral, Everyone there knows about the situation, and yet 
the understanding was it was better for the reputation of the family to for her to go about life like that and live in this horrible situation and then die by suicide, die at her own hands, rather than bring shame to the family. And while that's not the story in my family, we certainly haven't had any forced marriages as far as I am aware in in these times. There are other issues around marriage and um, shame that we have been carrying. And that attitude is very similar in many aspects of Asian or South, uh, you know, Indian culture that I still see at times. Some people have processed it and so on and have more egalitarian ideas, but many don't. And that idea of shame where you're bringing the family's name into question and disrepute in by being the way she described those words hit me so hard and i really couldn't um that the image the the way she was talking about the situation kept coming back to me and so on and i was thinking gosh how much of my life how much of those people who came before me Whose shame am I am I still carrying? And am I still carrying it, the feeling guilty? Um, am I still carrying all that in my body in some way? And I, the answer from my body was yes. Give me relief, yes. And, and this culture around shame really needs to change. This guilting people, this shame that we may be carrying that is not even necessarily ours. And that a reputation of someone is way more important than someone else's well-being and safety is also a thing that I think we need to be challenging more of, whether that is cultural or ethnic or um, whether that is, you know, not. There's so many elements in our culture that seem to allow this behavior to continue in so many instances. Even in business, like these are pers- the first two snippets I gave were personal, but even in business, I was mistreated and by other small business owners that either wanted my services for free and didn't weren't upfront about that into, you know, that, that desire they had and would pick my brain to the point that I would be depleted and they weren't going to nourish me. There, there were, you know, like many of us, making mistakes, uh, making missteps in this online world and being, while I totally want to be called in to do better, some of these were not kind attacks or a call to do better. They were opportunities to tear me down. And I've seen that happen a lot of times. That's why I really want to be careful with the words and the way I speak sometimes, because I know that all too well being on the receiving end and also being on the giving end in a way that it will cause and create change without necessarily tearing someone down or creating a shame culture. Um, People taking advantage. There was many times where I would be asked to support a business owner in selling a product or attending an event or promoting something and how I was taken advantage of to the point of it tore me apart when those situations fell apart and the person got to go on their merry way and I was left holding this guilt and shame and felt like an outcast, quite frankly. Instead of speaking up for myself, I I turned inward. I turned that blame inward. I blamed myself. I stayed silent. As I said, that's part of, could be part of a trauma response in, in others. Certainly, I found that to be true. I thought other people must be agreeing with them complicitly. So I thought maybe there's a reputational piece. Maybe they were gossiping about me. Maybe they you know, we're just being mean spirited and this kind of mean girl culture that we have that, you know, me, some people uh, creating us and them situations and hurting others in order to, um, 
you know, alleviate themselves or, you know, elevate themselves in some way. So that does happen. So I wasn't sure, hey, is this the truth that they said? Is this me making a really big mistake, being a burden, creating trouble and really needing to watch myself? Or was this the, you know, so was this the truth or was this not? Or what part of this was the truth? And I just believed it as it came that this must be an indictment of who I am and how I show up in the world, even though I do my best to show up with compassion and kindness for others, that maybe I had taken some missteps and maybe the price of that was this um, silencing the shame culture that you know what we like you silent don't don't talk anymore and that other people might be filling in parts of the narrative through gossip and other things and i believe that whether some of it really happened or not i don't know but i began to doubt relationships i began to doubt myself and i stopped showing up i stopped showing up in a zillion ways and i thought i thought many times did anybody notice that I stopped showing up like that? Did they care? Or, you know, if I, if I had not been around, if I had hurt myself, unalive to myself, would it have mattered? Um, Those were thoughts that went in my head in very dark moments. And that's not easy to say. And do take care of yourself in, in any of what I'm saying. Again, I just want to remind you that this was my, this was the piece that kept coming up internally. Hey, have I really caused that much trouble? Have I caused that much harm? Am I really being a burden? Have I gotten, you know, am I just not able to see the truth for what it was? And and I wasn't the perfect victim. That made the whole thing worse. You know, I've made mistakes. I'm a human. I have I have many flaws. I have misstepped. And I have tried, but I have continued to try my best and I've continued to unlearn the harmful things and learn new behaviors and apologize for my actions where I can, where it makes sense, where I'm, you know, where there's a relationship and I can create amends. I have tried to do that. Other times I have not succeeded. I have given up because I've already thought it's a foregone conclusion and I shouldn't. And maybe I shouldn't have given up so easily, but it wasn't easy. It was after a pattern of so much harm and so much weight from that shame and the guilt that I was carrying that I just decided I couldn't fight against the tide anymore. And so perhaps there's more work to do on that front for me. So I'm certainly not a perfect victim, but I do want to say I bring a quality of earnestness to whatever I'm doing that I want to do my best. And I want, and I believe in community and relationship and I don't want to harm people. And in the process of that, I forgot that I'm a human too. And I don't deserve to be harmed so egregiously by so many different people. And for there not to be any space for myself, my story, my humanity, my truth in a way. And so I lost sight of that. I forgot that. I, I never learned it to begin with. And I've had to pick it up in a big way the last few months. So that story was really important. I took people's words to heart. I took their silences to mean something that maybe that wasn't being said, but I assumed it was being said. Um, I believed their words. I believed their actions. And I thought, hey, that must be an accurate reflection of me and and a accurate reflection of the situation. And maybe it wasn't. And maybe I had to question some of those things. And given my work is so much about questioning people, questioning um, biases, questioning paradigms, questioning how these things shape us in how colonial and capitalistic patterns really shape us, who we are, how we show up, the actions we take and the ways we do our work that it would be easy, but it was so difficult because I didn't value myself because I didn't know how to do that. I was easy to, um, it was easy for me to abandon myself because that's the only way I had been shown how repeatedly in my life. So it was courageous in a, in a sense for me to name this and even for me to share this here with you. And, you know, that's recently I also watched the Meghan Markle and Harry 
videos that were recently posted on Netflix. And that brought up so many memories. It brought up so many memories of harm and the way they brought up their truths in a way that was really helpful. The way they were speaking truth to power, they were naming what was happening. And yet there's this a barrage of comments and um, negative propaganda about them. And I remember thinking the fact that my pain in times was this grist for mill, this gossip that went to my extended family or perhaps went to my networks as uh, when I was a business, you know, earlier in my business career journey, that maybe these people are sharing these things about me and they were and at, at my expense, but nobody would then come up to me and say that they would just not talk to me anymore as if that was the truth like that that's it it's defined we we know who you are now and we're not going to spend time with you anymore we're not going to give you the time of day but we're certainly going to make sure that um you know what what's happening in that way but we're not going to actually directly speak to you directly address the issue directly support you and we're going to make sure that the the people who did the harm um not, nothing will happen to them. They will be protected in a way. And um, that's for you to deal with, I guess. I don't know what the thought there is, but certainly the thought wasn't for my humanity and actually trying to reach out to me. And so left in that kind of difficult place, I had to do that for myself. And I found support systems to get me to that place. Several, um, I remember a few years ago, with that royal wedding, Meghan and Harry's wedding, I remember being vocal about the harms that the the institution of the royal family has done and how they were going about things. And I was concerned because as a person of color, how would she be treated in this institution? And I was I was silenced. People took umbrage with what I was saying, that it was at the expense of some people finding joy or happiness in this moment and so on. Um, and they abandoned me. They they questioned my bias. And as anybody should, right? What's my bias? Well, I'm very anti-colonial, very anti-royal um, in my perspective. And maybe when I was younger, I, I might have been interested in that um, narrative that was being pushed by the royal family. But um, when I didn't know very much, but certainly as I've aged, that's not been the case. I have been very vocal about that. But people questioned me to the point and they abandoned me. And, um, and it felt like uh, parts of my business were ripped away from me overnight because I had this. And at the same time, my migraine started and my chronic illness went totally um, amok. My symptoms started then and only increased and, and, you know, new symptoms have been added to the mix. And at the same time, there was things going on personally with extended family, with the impact of Brexit, you know, all of these other things that also impacted me. So it was like this perfect storm of, oh my God, <laughs> this is what people must be thinking about me. This is how people are behaving. People are treating me like this. Maybe it's true. Um, the world is obviously thinking certain things I found out many things. And I don't want to share any specifics here because that, that the, the specifics don't matter, but the world saying, or the UK saying, Hey, as a, as a person of color in this country, you don't matter. And to, with buses that said, go home and knowing that certain people in my extended family here, my in-laws and so on support that kind of rhetoric, that was so harmful. So there was and that rising rhetoric in the US, meaning I can't necessarily go home and not face this even more. So where do I belong? Where do I live in the world? How do I just do what I think is necessary? 
not only to survive and thrive, but also teach this message of undoing this because we need to. The planet is, you know, we're in active climate catastrophe. We are in a time of fascism rising. We are in a time where we need to be doing this work more than ever. And I think when people will say to me, your message matters, and then these abuses continue to happen. And I was often silent about it. I wouldn't tell anyone I would suffer alone. And I it would make me um, even be more hesitant to connect and reach out to people that like, this is the abuse that's happening. So when I watched this program, it totally, I totally resonated. I was like, this is the hellscape I've been living in, not just in the world stage. I don't have that attack from the the world stage, but seeing what's happening globally certainly impacted me and the ways that impacted me personally. Um, But also in my personal life and my business life, how I, how these things were shaping me, how I just felt like this might be the truth and there's no, yeah, there's no end in sight. And so I crumpled inward. I pointed the fingers at myself and said, and I followed that line of the victim blaming mentality, the the self gaslighting that maybe this is true. And so many things have happened in there that if I started to enumerate them to people close to me, that they would be surprised. They have been surprised that I was holding all of this by myself and didn't feel like I could share it in any way or in any sizable way. And when I did try to share, there were further attacks or, uh, you know, further abandonments that happened or further incidents that happened on the back of that. So it became very difficult for me to share any aspect of what was going on. Um, it accurately to anybody. So I bore a lot of it myself. And I just want to say, if you're in that position, that I see you, that I I appreciate the position you're in and that you're not alone in that. And I don't know if it's safe for you to reach out, but if you can, even if it is to your higher self or, you know, the land, the land can be so healing So if there is a way for you to outlet some of this, please do that. Please take care of yourself. We need you here. We do. And that's the message that I had needed so many times that I'm courageous for just showing up and facing these things day in and day out, that my body was a testament to this, and that all of these were signs that I had to deny myself. And the more I believed that, the more I thought I didn't belong here, but the, the antidote was to remember that I am valuable and that I'm valuable beyond what I might say or do. I'm valuable beyond the wisdom that I might give people. Um, and I still don't believe it all the time, but I did have to say I have to be me, right? I can't continue to deny myself because that is certainly impacting my health and my mental well-being, among other things. So don't keep silent about it. And if you have to be silent about it right now, know that you're not alone in some way. Somebody out there is supporting you. Something is working in your favor and keep strong for that. Um, So I internally gave up, as I said, I gave up. I stopped trying. I stopped reaching out. Um, only occasionally would I bring it up and it would become such a litany when I would that I would think, oh my gosh, are people going to believe me? Are they going to think I'm just making it up or whatever? And maybe some people did, but there were some people who stood by me, who listened, who wanted to help me by giving me a shoulder to cry on or be with me or um, chip in a little bit here or there on my business or something I'm working on. And just to let me know that I wasn't alone, that I was in solidarity with people who did care, who wanted to help me. And also that I had to do that myself, that for myself. So without that, there was times without that capacity, I fell into a pool of shame. And I, I definitely, that defined how I showed up, how I, how I showed up or sometimes how I didn't show up. Um, And since watching that video with that South Asian 
diasporic person um, and the series on Netflix, I have felt like my body has been screaming at me. You are carrying this guilt and shame and it's time to let it go. And I've been doing my own work around my ancestors and numbers of other human beings who are very loving. I'm not going to mention all of them, but you probably know who you are if you're watching. Thank you. And I will give shout outs separately and um, and so on. I have plans for that in the new year. So hang tight on that if you need more specific resources. Um, but one of the pieces I wanted to end with is this work I've been doing with my ancestors. So we have had a, a back and forth dialogue for a number of years. And, you know, some some pieces have been very helpful to me. So I was sharing about the shame that I'm carrying. And I said, you know, some of this is not even mine. Some of this is intergenerational or collective levels of trauma. Some of this is specific to our own family or to our own culture. And here's all the things, some of what I shared with you here about being in that relationship and leaving that fiance and that being the the gossip express that became, you know, a certain people, that gossip express of, oh, this person now shamed us or isn't worthy of anything because they left this person instead of marrying. And that would have been better. You know, these kinds of things showed up you know, the, that I was able to name them. And so I started naming them with my ancestors. I'm carrying this, this is this piece of history. I see that how it's come through our family, this, this thing, this shame around this, you know, and I just named them all. I named all of the ones that I could think of. And there's a lot that I don't know, right? So I just said, there's so many others that aren't nameable that I know we're still carrying in our family line and isn't there something we can do about it? And so then spontaneously 30 or 40 ancestors, and I don't know who they are and I don't know their names, but they shared with me what they were dealing with. Shame of being left by a lover, shame of doing care work, for, forced to do care work that they didn't actually want to be doing, forced to, you know, um, shame around, you know, their queerness, shame around how they wanted to be in the world and they couldn't be, um, shame around their job, shame around not having a job, shame around not being able to support um, themselves or their loved ones. And, and so many of them were things like, wow, we all hold these levels of shame, right? So they were so beautiful to share, to listen, to witness in the dark moments in the night. This is the conversation we had over a series of nights. And it really broke something. It was like collectively we came together in that moment and that sedimentary layer called shame. We all decided we we're going to break through it together. And we did. I'm not saying that it's all gone and that we don't have anything to deal with left. There's residues. There's still feelings. As I said, there's aftermath and harm that I might have caused in all of this that I want to go make reparations for there might be apologies people make for me but I don't think I don't see those things happening or coming you know towards me anytime soon but I'm open to reopening the lines of communication with people if that is a thing they want to do um, and I want to be in a place where you know that I don't have to carry this anymore because I told them I'm still carrying this and that some of it was mine, but some of it was these stories, these, these attitudes, these vestiges of colonialism or patriarchy that still lived in us and that uh, this victim blame culture. And I didn't want it anymore. And they didn't want it either. And that that was really hurting our ability to move forward and flourish and thrive in this world. So that's what I want for you. I want you to flourish. I want you to thrive. I want you to start your own work and do it with such a verve because we need a revolution right now in so many ways. And we need people who can sustain this movement. And the more we're carrying this heavy baggage that's not ours, we can't make forward progress in any way. So it felt like this moment of connection and breaking through that layer of sediment together. And I don't know, honestly, what comes next for me in my personal life. 
or in my business in many respects. And there's pieces I do know and see, but I'm not going to talk about those today. I don't feel like those are as important, but I feel like there's spaciousness for the first time in a long time, not just from moving, but also the spaciousness with creating things in a way that supports my neurodivergence and really the emotional capacity that has been freed up from dealing with some of these prior traumas that I've been carrying for many years and ancestrally or intergenerationally things that have been through generations that we've collectively been carrying in our family and world that we've continued to carry that are not doing us good. But in releasing some of that, there has been so much internal, so much mental, so much physical space for something new to be planted, for something new to happen, for new directions and new tendrils to blossom. So I hope that can happen for you in some way, shape or form. So I don't know what's going to happen. But I welcome your reflections, your thoughts, sharing about your shame. I would love to hear in the comments how your journey around this, about reclaiming yourself, about shedding these layers of intergenerational, personal, or collective trauma and shame and guilt have been acting through you. I would love to hear in the comments. I I intend to read every comment and I will respond as well. This is important conversation that I hope to spark. And the ways that this colonial and capitalistic indoctrination still continue to act in us, act within us, and how they shape how we show up in the world. I want to change that narrative. And Shane is just one of those conversations that I would like to be having. Thank you so much. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching and witnessing me. And I want to thank you for sharing your own story and for being here. And I also just want to finish by saying that I I, pr- I truly appreciate you. And I really am grateful for those who have stood by me in some of these very rough times. And I'm hoping that I am turning a new leaf and I want you to know I'm okay. So I, I so I just, I don't want you to be too concerned. I'm in good hands and I have a good network and team around me right now. And I hope and I wish for you to have the same. All right. Much love here from London and I will see you in the next video.